Okay, so good morning, everyone. Welcome to our pre-summit uh, webinar. Um, I would like to introduce uh, the featured speaker today. Uh, we're in luck. We've got an excellent speaker with Dr. Rachel Asinwasis. She's a dermatologist and clinician researcher based in Western Canada. She's the founder of Origins Dermatology Center, a combined multidisciplinary model that services both the general population and provides outreach clinics for underserved remote and rural Indigenous communities. Rachel is of Plains Cree, Soto and English background, and she carries a Master's of Science in Health Sciences in Clinical and Translational Research. Dr. Sinawasis is also the chair of the Canadian Indigenous Skin Spectrum Summit. So before I hand it over to uh, Dr. Sinawasis, I would like to I would like to say a few uh, words and give some information. So registration is still open. Uh, the 8th Annual Virtual Patients Redefining the Future of Healthcare in Canada Summit and Pre-Summit webinars are taking place virtually November 6th and the week of November uh, 13th. Oops, just wait. Week of November 13th, 2023. To register, to register visit www.patientsredefininghealthcare.ca. And also, I'd like to uh, thank our sponsors, Janssen, Merck, uh, Pfizer, Roche, Sanofi, Amgen, Bristol Myers Squibb, AstraZeneca, and Novartis. And a thank you also to our working group sponsors, Innovative Medicines Canada. And just some housekeeping uh, notes. So throughout the webinar, participants will be muted and video will be kept off because we are recording. This session is being recorded in English and French. To access French interpretation, click world icon at the bottom of your screen, click mute original auto, audio, and then select French. To submit a question, click chat at the bottom of the screen, type your question and press enter. So if you have te technical difficulties, contact Lance Lee via the chat function. Okay, and also help us spread the word, post to social media using the following hashtags. Hashtag patient redefining healthcare, hashtag patient summit 2023, and hashtag patients redefining HC 2023. So, without further ado, I would like to uh, hand over the mic to Dr. Rachel Asinawasis. Thank you, Sharon. Um, so, I'm really honored to be here. My name is Rachel. I'm a dermatologist based in Saskatchewan. And I'm going to share my screen with you. Um, you can see my presentation. Okay. There we go. Showing up okay for you guys? Looks good. Okay. So a little bit of a funny story. I never get sick. And a lot of it is because I'm always at work and I don't really go out that much. But uh, I went to Saskatoon this weekend and I went through a walk through haunted house in an old theater. And uh, they had smoke machines going, long waiting lists. And uh, I thought I was just thinking, oh, with all these people in here screaming, I'm going to get sick. I like haven't been sick in a long time. And of course, I, I got a little sick. So don't mind my scratchy throat. <clears> throat> Anyways, um, so here we're going to review an evidence based approach to addressing Indigenous health disparities. Uh, using a dermatological focus. And here are my disclosures. Um, I've been on some advisory boards for uh, medical dermatology. And uh, if there's anything off label, I will declare that. And uh, this is based on my own opinion. So the first thing I wanted to start with is a general overview on skin of color. Why is it important? Where are some gaps in education and research representation with regards to those with diverse skin tones? And then we, that's just a brief touch on this. And then we go right into Indigenous health. And I'm going to be using a broad evidence-based review of an ongoing scoping review of North American Indigenous skin disease. And I'm going to point out from, again, an evidence-based lens and clinical experience, uh, what are the top problems that we need to address? 
And I always say that the skin is a manifestation of internal and external health. So by looking at someone's skin, we can tell if there are environmental or home uh, disparities or disparities, you know, and uh, social determinants of health that might lead to poor outcomes. And in dermatology these days, I find there's a lot of talk when I go to conferences on things under the microscope and what we call basic science, which, and I know there's a broad audience here, so I'm trying my best to tailor this presentation. Um, I did a similar presentation for uh, the Canadian Patient Skin Alliance Breaking Barriers. So always looking for feedback. But I find when I've been, I've been in dermatology for 15 years now, since I started residency, and a lot of our conferences focus on these basic science or you know, clinical trials that are not necessarily externally valid to uh, wider populations. And so I call that kind of number one, and there's a lot of cool stuff happening there. We're learning a lot about differences in structure and function of the skin uh, and how that might predispose um, certain clinical presentation or management principles, endophenotypes and atopic dermatitis, lots of things going on there. But one thing I'm here to talk about you today is more in number two, the health disparities that uh, we don't always see in these sorts of studies. Uh, and often they're, they're, they're complicated, they're overlapping in many different areas of the socio-ecological model. So I'm going to be focusing on that today. Um, and again, I'm very uh, happy to be here uh, having a patient-oriented program. So why is skin of color important in general? So we know that there is increasing representation of visible minorities in Canada, and this is projected to increase. Indigenous peoples are representing currently approximately 5% of Canadians and are also known to be one of the fastest growing groups and the youngest. We know that again, touching base on, you know, exciting time in dermatology, there can be differences in things like structure and function of the epidermis or the immune system that we're seeing in certain groups. But one thing that we also do know from the literature and from practice that there are also disparities being faced um, it, uh, in North America, and I'm going to be reviewing the Indigenous context with you today. Um, this is the traditional Fitzpatrick scale that we use in dermatology, although calls to action have been made to make it more diverse and represented, representative. It's actually based on predisposition of burning and tanning. So you see there are six skin types here. Um, and, you know, we, we live in a diverse world, uh, but what we do know is that certain things might look different on more richly pigmented skin tones. An example of this is one of the scores that we use to look at redness on the skin called erythema may not be as the classical red that we see in deeper skin tones that are more melanated. It may appear, for example, more shades of violaceousness or hyperpigmentation or gray hues. So we often have to take a careful history and ensure that we're capturing those eight markers of inflammation and not underestimating the disease. So there are many considerations here kind of beyond the scope of this talk, but uh, if you're ever interested, I'm uh, I could we could always chat more about that. So going into why Indigenous health is important, Canada we know is diverse and multicultural, um, and we know that Indigenous peoples are also very diverse in many ways. But one thing that that we would argue is that there are historical and social and legal uh, commonalities that have been faced by many um, peoples and populations that have contributed to complex health disparities. Um, and again, we know that one of them that I'm going to really focus on today is the rural and remote location of many of my patients. Something as simple as fundamental healthcare access may be, may be a barrier for them. Other examples, um, and I know that everybody kind of has different levels of understanding, but um, some real tangible examples that I always like to say is that, you know, often we think about this happening hundreds of years ago, but we still know that um, there are some facts, like the residential school, the last closed in 1996, uh, my own father attended for almost a decade. Um, and there, we know that there has been some intergenerational trauma from, from that. Um, Indigenous peoples were not allowed to vote until 1960 without losing their status. Um, and then certain uh, systems like the Indian Act, which limited personal and economic freedom, was only repealed in 1951. Um, and same with uh, reservations, again, being uh, actually historically representing legislated racial segregation. And we're seeing some issues with the housing quality on reserve with regards to aggravation of skin disease. So what are the priorities? 
um, you know, this we first for me, I always like to try to come from an evidence base, although there is gaps in the literature. So I'm going to review with you what we know from my scoping review that's still in progress. Um, what do we know about what's common and what's problematic? Uh, what do we know from our clinical experiences and what is the media showing? And the other thing I want to let you know, too, is I know I do come from an evidence-based background, but my actual full-time job is seeing patients. <laughs> and I've been in practice now for going on 10 years. Um, so I've seen a lot of these disparities in real lifetime in some of the communities that I have. So what are the big three priorities for stakeholders in summary? And I'm going to go through some information on all of these. And again, it's a big topic, lots of moving parts. So it's going to be, I can't fit this all in in an, in an hour. So I'm going to be brief and touch on what I can. The big three here, number one by far is eczema, also commonly referred to, or I should say atopic dermatitis, also commonly referred to eczema. Bacterial skin infections are number two. And these are communicable and curable conditions. Diabetic skin complications, including ulcers and uh, poor outcomes with amputations, we're also seeing. Those are the big three that I have come up with from our evidence-based review that I'm going to review. Other areas of interest, and I know that we have um, some representatives here from Canadian psoriasis, and I did want to include some extra information because I think we need to explore the impact of psoriasis on these populations as well. Um, we're also seeing uh, increased reports of scabies, which might be aggravated by crowded housing conditions, um, acne and rosacea, hydratinitis suppurativa, and diseases of the hair, nails, and mucous membranes. With regards to the top three that I touched on, there are some basic review articles I can forward to the group if you're interested in that I've also helped to co-author. Recently, within the past couple of years, we conducted a national healthcare practitioner review of ranging from dermatologists to pediatricians to family physicians and nurses. And it was geared towards those who worked for or in Northern and remote Canadian Indigenous communities. And we had 50 participants and we asked them, and again, the publication has been submitted to the Journal of Rural Health. More details will be available when it's published, hopefully soon. Um, but we asked these patients, you know, what were the most frequently observed skin conditions? And the big three that came out, uh, when you look at kind of the most common being orange, and then second most common being yellow, we're seeing if you take the totality of those numbers and which ones were ranked highest, the big three spilled out to be eczema, bacterial skin infections, and diabetic skin ulcers. Here are the other areas of interest as well. These findings were also um, correlated in another survey we did back in 2018 of nurses working in Saskatchewan, um, 43 of them, or sorry, 46 of them. Uh, they were actually, this was actually a nurse-based uh, review. Again, we are seeing very similar themes reported here. Um, barriers to care might include things like cost, transportation, long waiting times, travel barriers, extensive skin instructions, um, safe water access, and other barriers, which we're going to touch on. And again, these are in rural and remote communities. Um, moving forward with this, we asked our healthcare uh, practitioner participants to, and again, and I always say I understand that this is not the most robust study design, but when you something you don't know a whole lot about in the Canadian context, we often have to start with these basic designs such as surveys to kind of get some groundwork going. Um, but, you know, when it comes down to rating the, the severity of the disease, and we gave definitions on that, whether it's wide body surface area, psychosocial impact, um, quality of life, you will actually see that the, the majority of our participants rated these conditions often being moderate to severe, especially the top three, and not always fully controlled, uh, with many reporting poorly controlled or uh, managed some of the time. So that's uh, another thing we need to be aware of. More uh, consistently reported barriers uh, that we found in accessing skin health care amongst these communities. The yellow bar here shows that the majority of per healthcare care part practitioner participants <clears throat> agreed or strongly agreed on a Likert scale that proximity to access to healthcare services 
costs associated with skin treatment, supply and access to fundamental care for things like atopic dermatitis, moisturizer and pharmacy um, were limited. Uh, they also agreed that, you know, there might often be overwhelming skin regimens and instructions that can be overwhelming to the patient, which indicates possibility for therapeutic patient education. And the classic example that I'm going to review with you is in the case of eczema, I call it the diabetes of dermatology because it's common, it's chronic, and if it's not controlled, it can have many potential um, complications ranging from physical, mental, psychosocial, uh, and so forth. And, uh, you know, we, the counseling time is just like with diabetes, hypoallergenic skin care, bathing, moisturizing, this topical can go here, but not there. This lotion can only go here. This is how you manage flares. These are signs of infections. It's a lot of, of counseling. And I think that that can be overwhelming for many uh, physicians and who are time pressed and for patients who have to hear all of this information or caregivers. Um, other issues that were identified were things like transportation issues, limited resources in the community to meet follow-up, an example of that being availability of healthcare practitioners, um, and then implementation barriers, things like overcrowded housing conditions might lead to increased risk of communicable infectious disease. Um, and then we kind of received mixed responses on uh, NIHB coverage. So moving forward, talking about eczema or atopic dermatitis, what we look at here at the First Nations Regional Health Survey that was conducted, uh, published in 2012, and then actually the National Health Survey. So again, these are surveys that the government refers to. And if you actually look at the statistics in children and youth, we're consistently seeing the atopic triad, which I'm going to, it's basically a cluster of conditions, atopic and allergic conditions that show together, often first presenting with eczema, very similar immune mechanisms and predispositions. We're seeing that these are very commonly reported in these cross-sectional surveys. Um, the other thing is, if you look at the national uh, survey of that's the compilation, if you look, for example, in, in youth and children actually receiving treatment for their condition, despite barriers noted, you'll see that eczema is up at the top. And to, I couldn't find any qualitative information on why that is in the survey. So we need that information. But what this tells me between the lines is that if many of these patients are facing barriers and living rurally and remotely, and that's the top reason they're seeking care, it means that there's some kind of impact. So that's something I think needs to be explored. The other thing that I'm consistently doing is fighting people to prove that eczema is not just a skin problem. And I shouldn't say fighting, but I've had my share of meetings um, and I feel like, and again, I'm just being candid here. I feel like when I talk to some of these policy and decision makers, when I talk about diabetes or hypertension, like other chronic conditions, there's, it's like a no contest. Like, yeah, we know that these are problems. We know what this is. But when I say like eczema or atopic dermatitis, I feel like often there isn't necessarily the full understanding of the scope of the impact of the problem. And I do wonder if some of that is related also to the lack of general education on the public level and at the level of our healthcare practitioner curriculums, where they may see a lot of things covered over and over again, whereas skin may not necessarily be as well covered. They might only get a week or two of skin in all of their medical school, for example, or nursing school, whereas there's a lot of cross-cutting vertical and horizontal overlap with other organ systems. And I think that's something that needs to be recognized as well. Um, so we see here that atopic conditions, starting with atopic dermatitis, many will go on to develop, especially, you know, if they're poorly controlled or getting more into moderate severe cases, you can imagine that these comorbidities can have a significant impact on the patient that goes beyond just the skin. This is further compounded by the fact that those with poorly controlled atopic dermatitis through a fundamentally impaired skin barrier and abnormal immune response, we know that there are increased baseline risk of skin infections. And these are all public media photos that I've been seeing. And I do see this case frequently in my rural communities um, that often secondary infection is present and bacterial infection in particular, like uh, impetigo or boils or other pustular skin infections, cellulitis, 
we're seeing these things on top of eczema, and I've seen many of these cases. So we need to also look at what is the overlap between these two conditions, given uh, that they're being identified as common. Um, and again, you know, there, most of this literature we have is out of Northern Ontario and Quebec. But what I see here as a dermatologist, I see crusted impetigo uh, on top of uh, poorly controlled atopic dermatitis. And for and and the other thing too is I again to emphasize it goes beyond the skin. You see here in the news that there's a lot of eczema being found. Um, they're itchy. Itchy can be itching can be very impactful, very similar to a chronic pain on people. Um, but it, imagine most of these are children as well because of the atopic dermatitis. The over ninety percent or so start before age five. So this is a problem we're seeing with children and youth. But you can see here that they're being bullied. And the, I have kids telling me this too in the clinic, like they're being bullied. Um, you know, obviously a more severe case, there could be a, a suicidal risk. Um, but again, you know, uh, I think that there's a problem that we're seeing in some communities. Um, and to date, I just want to say I'm not aware of any working groups that have been made formally to address this problem with regards to guidelines or um, healthcare practitioner uh, meetings. And again, going back to AD beyond the skin, uh, it is well documented that especially when moderate to severe and poorly controlled, you can see that there are many wide ranging impacts on these uh, affected patients, not to mention the caregiver impact if they're children. Um, and that, you know, uh, we have to open up this conversation a little better. Going now, into bacterial skin infections, which was the which was another which is another area of high priority identified in our national healthcare practitioner survey. If you go into the literature, and I'm happy to provide these to anybody who wants them, I will. I'm very happy to provide them. If you look at these areas, which are all from northern and remote indigenous communities across Canada, broadly, we are seeing high rates of skin and soft tissue infections bacterial skin infections like staph, strep, and MRSA. And there's a question here. So skin infections, common, high incidence rates, um, many being MRSA. The question becomes what role can skin conditions play in this? Well, some of these articles do mention that skin conditions like wounds or chronic dermatitis are common comorbidities found in these patients? So the question becomes that what role does the skin play a portal of entry and how can we treat that underlying skin disease if it is present? If you look at all of these articles again, barriers that come together as common themes are the location, limited access for uh, early diagnosis and management, overcrowded conditions may exacerbate uh, infections, <clears throat> um, I'm, water, I'm going to actually touch on a little bit about that later. Um, and then the other thing that, that I think is troublesome too is we can't do swabs in all the communities. So if we're worried, for example, about MRSA, often I see people getting like higher strength antibiotics for MRSA without doing a swab because they can't necessarily do a swab, you know? So they often get preemptively treated for MRSA because the swab infrastructure is not there in these remote communities. Um, the other barrier, too, is often, you know, in some of the northern areas, the um, cost can be a lot higher for over-the-counter fundamentals, such as a laundry detergent. I also wanted to take some time to talk about psoriasis, because I'll tell you why first. I was, in my scoping review, I was looking up information um, on psoriasis and Indigenous peoples, and I was, like, Googling, because I couldn't find much. And I came up to this slide. And I thought nearly absent in North American Indians. And the first question I had was, is this indigenous peoples of North America? Are they referring to or are they referring to, you know, maybe people from India? And I don't know. I'm just throwing that question out there. And I looked at the references and I was unable to find any information to back up that it was nearly absent. More so, I actually found there was a paucity of information. And again, I'm happy to share my uh, my scoping review will be coming out. Um, but what we do know about psoriasis, I see a lot of cases and my colleagues see a lot of cases. It was reported in both of our healthcare practitioner surveys that psoriasis is, is uh, not uncommon in Indigenous peoples. 
Um, so again, you know, I think that we need to um, open up this discussion because there's a lot of observed comorbidities in many of these patients that present with moderate to severe psoriasis. Um, so I think, again, we need more information on that. And you can also, if you come to our Indigenous Skin Summit on the 25th, uh, we're going to elaborate on this more. Bottom line, more information needed. Um, and we know, again, that psoriasis is a very comorbid condition. So, um, yeah, I just because more information is needed, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Um, and again, we are seeing psoriasis here. So just examples that it is uh, being seen in the media, it's being seen in the limited amount of studies we have. Um, I do some remote care, um, a mixed model uh, through in-person uh, and virtual care. This year, we're um, there's just so busy stuff going on here in Regina. I'm mostly focusing on the south and virtual care to the north this year. But in the in the past, most recently is is last year actually, I was up at, at at the communities in the north, and we find that these are frequently underserviced, especially the more remote they are. And there are many um, barriers that might uh, present. For example, if someone needs to do an urban based appointment, they have to often travel um, hundreds or more kilometers. Um, so I'm just going to quickly go through some quick snapper cases just so you get an idea of what could be barriers. We have a guy in his 30s, multiple comorbidities from southern Saskatchewan. He's got moderate to severe psoriasis. He has no access to phototherapy, which is required as often as a criteria to fail phototherapy or not have access for more modern therapeutics. And he's probably not the best candidate for traditional systemic immunotherapy, like as methotrexate, these broad anti-metabolic and uh, uh, immunosuppressants given his comorbidities. The community was periodically shut down over the pandemic and it was challenging for him to access the lab or the healthcare practitioner. Here's another case from Northern Saskatchewan. Um, this this uh, uh, person had um, extensive psoriasis with comorbidities and please don't share these photos. The patients have very kindly allowed me to use them for education purposes, uh, but not to be shared. Um, and she only speaks Dene, this patient, so we have to arrange translation. Um, we had a lot of problems coordinating her care uh, with the language barriers, the lack of connection to reach her in some of her community, in a very remote community, often her phone was cracking out. Um, she was overdue for a TB test, that took us a long time to arrange. Sometimes their uh, application scores might expire for pending on tests we can't get. We had delays getting her injection doing to, from nurse station capacity issues. There's a lot of coordination going on between our remote care coordinator. And the ultimate uh, outcome of this is, unfortunately, we, uh, we lost our contact with her after the forest fires. So um, it just goes to show that there can be many areas uh, here in these northern and remote areas. So um, going back to this, um, we also need to be aware that given this, these barriers, especially that these northern and remote populations in which many Indigenous peoples live, especially out west, um, you know, we, we need to support uh, access to new and innovative therapies uh, if from an equitable lens. Um, we know that there are some disparities in BC beyond the scope of this article, but there is a guide to NHB in which in Canadian Dermatology Today, which I touch on that if you want to look at, talks a bit about the BC situation. So this is a broad overview of many problems and I know it seems overwhelming talking about these things. Um, and I know there's kind of a multi-stakeholder audience here, and I would be happy to tailor this talk based on the audience. But again, I'm trying to be able to touch on a bit for everybody. Um, these are complex problems, but there are potential for solutions. I do think there needs to be a working group for some of the disparities we are seeing from an evidence base, media base, and clinical base. Um, and that, you know, um, there might be regional differences. We acknowledge that there are regional differences in diversity in terms of access. Um, but you know, some regions may be in more need for others. But it is worth noting, given how big Canada is, you know, and up to one in five Canadians live rurally and remotely, with the most uh racial and ethnic population being represented indigenous, you know, um, we need to think about pathways towards solutions. 
And one that I think holds a lot of promise is virtual care. Um, you can see here that, you know, in heavily urban based areas, um, you know, generally there's much higher density of dermatologists, specialists, healthcare access in general. But those who are out more in the outreaches, you know, ha that have to drive hundreds or thousands of kilometers, what can we do to help close some of these cost gaps? And this is not just for skin disease, it's a general lump. But if you actually look at the 2022 report on NHB expenditure in millions in one year alone between 2021 to 2022, there was over 602 million uh, charges on medical transportation. So that's a lot of money that I wonder if we could have some cost access quality savings by looking at uh, the role of things like virtual care. And it's worth noting that virtual care is not a one size fits all. There are definite barriers um, such as, you know, as identified in our survey, images sent by remote patients may not be of adequate quality. Um, their infrastructure might not be reliable in rural or remote areas. An example of that is when I'm up, up at some of the communities, I'm like, try to call my mom. You know, if you're even on the outskirts or sometimes even in the community itself, it's unreliable connections. Um, and many of these people will work out of the city, like they are out of their, sorry, community you know, outdoors and so forth, where there's they're also very poor connections. So these are barriers, right? Other barriers um, could be, you know, there are some things we don't want to use virtual care for. It might not be safe. Like if someone has an obvious melanoma, we, you know, we want to look at it with dermoscopy, cut it out for histology, right? Do a skin check, check their lymph nodes. So again, where could this fit in? I think this could fit in with rashes. I think it could fit in well with rashes if we, there's a system for it. And we that's what we do here in our mixed model in Regina. But just to show that on a Likert scale, our participants recommended that virtual care has potential to, um, and this was uh, those who the majority agreed or strongly agreed, over 70%, can address travel barriers for patients in rural and remote areas can make dermatologists care more accessible. However, they did mention things like in-person uh, visits are useful, um, can be cost-effective compared to seeing patients in person. So ideally, probably a blended model is needed. But other little thoughts came up, like maybe we can use it for patient education or coordination of care, such as in the case of atopic dermatitis or multiple um, you know, uh, in household transmissions of, for example, uh, in Batigo or MRSA or scabies uh, that might be transmitted. And I need to update the report on this, but what you can see here is um, this speed of 50 over 10 Mbps is what's recommended for fundamentals of telemedicine in this article. And I think there's actually a more up-to-date report I need to find. This one I only have from 2017. But you can see that there's a disparity in rural and remote areas and in Indigenous households not necessarily having this uh, ability to access. Going into what healthcare practitioners recommended, um, you know, the majority agreed or strongly agreed that these things, again, could improve uh, could, um, dermatology care. So you see them listed here. But there also was, was some food for thought in the open-ended comments. And I think we need more in-depth studies on this. I'm just going to turn my heater off here. It's just trying. Me. Um, and I'm going to read some of these to you. Um, there will never be enough dermatologists to adequately service these rural and remote communities. We need to focus on education of primary health care providers uh, and telemedicine to practically improve services. So there, there, there's an uh, important point there. Um, virtual care can increase the local team's capacity and we can work together for the patient. Um, as there are diabetic and wound nurses, we need dermatology nurses, for example, with the eczema and skin infection problem. I think we need to engage multidisciplinary uh, care in this. There's just so few dermatologists, and I think we need to, to um, you know, uh, broaden that base. Um, again, many believe that in-person care is important, as do I. Um, education on uh, type and depth of information on chronic disease, what is new, how does it present. Um, the other thing that came up was 
what I think is very important is to be able to train uh, rural physicians on fundamentals of basic procedures. So when I go up to some of the communities, there are some things I cannot do through virtual care. Biopsies, excisions, curetting, intralesional injections, IND, okay, and, and things like what we call intralesional steroid injections can do wonders for very thickened skin if they're not responding despite maximizing the topical therapy. And the next step would be systemic. So some of these things could actually help bridge care. Um, otherwise, what happens in my case is the patients will wait till I come to the community to get them. But now we're trying to engage some of our local uh, northern practitioners to be able to do things like Kenalog. So I think we need to have skill sessions for that or training sessions. Um, and then other, there are also comments on, um, you know, challenges of inflammation of such mm -hmm. virtual tools. So the other thing I just want to touch on is, um, as someone who has really scoured the literature in this, you'll see that Australia in particular has a lot more data on this. You know, down here in the bottom left, you see Australia, who, who the Indigenous populations who are rural in Australia face many similarities in historical contexts compared to Canadian Indigenous peoples um, and a history of colonization. And I, I just saying to my dad's a historian, I've learned a lot of this over the years from him and took some courses. But what I can tell you is um, things like the National Healthy Skin Guideline, we need one of these in Canada to control the impetigo scabies and maybe even eczema, right? So we need to have these guidelines here um, so they're not normalized, right? Um, and then learning needs of practitioners in rural and remote areas, also done out of Australia, looking at things that might be neglected diseases that might be common like HS, practitioner and patient satisfaction with virtual care, a review of the literature, including indigenous population, so again, I think we can learn from Australia. And of course, it's not identical, but if there's some way we could learn from them not to reinvent the wheel with some of these common problems, um, I think that would be amazing if we could do that. Um, other general solutions, and again, I realize the limitation of this talk is like really hard to put all these solutions into one talk, but you know, we have to encourage um diversity of trainees coming into dermatology and medicine. Uh, they may be more supportive of working in their home communities. So we need to be able to have awareness and encourage mentorship of patients, or sorry, of um, uh, trainees to serve their patients. Um, and in, in, including, uh, you know, emphasizing education on culturally competent approaches, improving representation or textbooks, and improving literature uh, research representation. We know that if you look in the literature, North American Indigenous peoples are broadly underrepresented in clinical trials, for example, involving things like psoriasis and eczema. And again, I have the literature to show you that if you're interested. Uh, they're, uh, they're pretty much consistently amongst the least uh, represented and definitely does not fit the uh, average population percentage of what we're seeing in North America. So there's room to improve that. Um, and then cultural competence, um, there's a really excellent module that was developed by CMP that I recommend because we can't be experts at everything and everybody and everybody's preferences, but there are approaches that can be respectful and sensitive to help improve pay, uh, shared decision-making uh, and patient outcomes. Other practical tips. When we're talking about eczema being so overwhelming with all of the instructions, a pictorial-based handout uh, might be helpful. Um, NHB, I, I feel that NHB is very progressive. I've had some meetings with them over the years, uh, and they're, I think that they're actually wonderful to work with to, in my experience, uh, and they're open to listening uh, to these concerns. But now they now cover a bland moisturizer for psoriasis and AD as a part of um, fundamental care. Again, we might see very high elevated cost shipping rates in the Northern areas that might be unaffordable for some. The only limitation of this is they will only cover a tub a month, which is usually uh, definitely inadequate, especially for adult populations. But that's a good step in terms of uh, proactive care. We know that moisturizing is a fundamental step in eczema control from a lifestyle and proactive point of view. Um, and then education like you're doing now. Uh, there's some really excellent course offered out in particular the University of Alberta and an overview to help understand why some of the health disparities might present the way they are today.
Other tips, um, you know, know your NHB coverage. That can help reduce paperwork burdens and get the patient on treatment better. And there's also a got that guy 10 HB if anybody's interested. It's in been recently released in Canadian dermatology today. I always say tubs, not tubes, especially for those with more moderate to severe forms of disease or more extensive body surface area. What I'm commonly observing is they're getting a small tube dispensed for a wide body surface area. And if they have to travel to the pharmacy, they're going to go through that really quickly, you know, and I always ask too, for prescribers, would you prescribe someone a week or two worth of their heart medication? And they all say, no, I would give them more. But if you look at the body surface area and these small tubes we're dispensing, often we're just not cutting it. So we don't want to under treat the condition. Um, again, we need strategies to manage eczema and reduce secondary infection. I know we have enough evidence base there to say that's needed. Um, and we need to, of course, always involve when there's a community-based study, uh, engage with the communities themselves and their leadership uh, using things such as OCAP principles um, and Indigenous research approach methodology approaches. But the other thing, too, is we have to engage the patient voice, um, just like you're, we're doing here and with CPSA. Um, you know, uh, and we need to also look at the curriculum because... If we're not, and again, you know, I hear the same thing from nurses or doctors, unless you're in dermatology, they get very little skin disease training compared to other organ systems. And I think that that might translate into a lack of confidence in diagnosing and managing or under managing or under or misdiagnosing. So again, I think we need to have like a fundamentals curriculum there. And, I, and the other thing I really think we need to do is engage a multidisciplinary approach to therapeutic patient education with regards to eczema. We know that these approaches can help improve adherence and self-management and empower the patients. And I think that my, my most favorite healthcare practitioner are nurses. <laughs> Hang on a second. I want to introduce you quickly to my nurses. Julianne Brendeley, come. And Leah, come to just really quick, just a quick introduction. Mm -hmm. So these, these are, this is our uh, nurses here, Hello. Brenda Lee and Julia, and this is our remote care coordinator, Leah. Hello. So these guys, just in one nutshell, do you guys agree that we see virtual care and in-person with Indigenous patients across the province? We see barriers, we see comorbidities, and that the nurse plays an essential role in helping to counsel and make sure the patient is being managed. Yes, yeah, definitely. 100%. And there's a lot of eczema and skin infections. Uh -huh. Do you guys see this? I'm not making it. Okay, I don't know. Okay, right now, I got to finish. <laughs> And fall is the worst. And winter. fall is the worst oh. in winter, she says. Yes. Okay, thank you, Brenda Lee. <laughs> okay, I'm almost done. Sorry, guys. We have fun here. Um, so in conclusion, um, skin health in Indigenous peoples is not just a skin problem. I just want you to look at the slide for a minute. So think about that for a minute. Can't at move or attend school, but keeping being told by the healthcare practitioners it's just eczema. And this is something I'm like hearing over and over again. It's like kind of driving me bonkers, you know, or at least the conception is there. And I think we need to bust that. Um, it goes beyond the skin and we need to start with what is common and what is known. Um, so we see, we reviewed some of the top three or the top five. We know that looking at someone's skin might be a clue to their environmental health, such as the crowded housing conditions and communicable disease. Um, no formal national working groups uh, exist with regards to these top three. So I hope one that we can do that. Um, and problems exist, and I know it's messy, but I do think that there are pathways towards solutions, uh, some of which we have reviewed today. Um, I'm running out of time now, and my voice is running out of... <laughs> um, but this is something that we uh, need to uh, focus on. So learn from Australia, make a group, right? Initiatives towards virtual care, hear from the patients, hear from the practitioners, um, just a really quick nutshell, how we operate is we have a combined model 
where our remote care coordinator uh, is an administrator. We've got a dedicated phone line for our patients. Um, so they get separated out from our general pra practice because often there might be a skin infection crisis that comes up or like an extended family who gets an infestation and it happens and they text us. Um, and that uh, the nurses really help with the counseling, uh, courtesy calls to the patient, make sure they're doing okay. Um, you know, and they work with us. And I really think that there's a huge need to have uh, this kind of support, especially for AD. Um, other things too is, you know, when we're looking at chest x-ray and TB tests, it's good to know where you can have these done because there can be barriers to accessing those in rural areas. Uh, pharmacy uh, delays are, are other topics we need to talk about ensuring we're dispensing the right amounts to treat. Um, you know, there, I do think that there are some approaches to, uh, improving contact of patients and working alongside, uh, a multidisciplinary team. So thank you for having me today. Again, a lot of information in one, I hope is it was within the scope of your interest and objectives. Um, and I would be happy to take any questions. And this is Jinx, he's a barn cat rescue. This is his costume. <laughs> and uh, my mom and my dad, they love to dress him up all mummies at work and send pictures. <laughs> <laughs> he's very cute. He's he very is, cute. thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Sinawasis. That was very informative, very interesting and has got me thinking a lot. Um, thank you. I work with the Saskatchewan Health Authority, so um, I can see some linkages and things that, yes. that you know, we can work on in the future. Yeah. Yes. Um, so anyways, we are running out of time. So I want to get to the questions here. So let me see. Uh, let's see. I had a question here. Okay. Okay. So you mentioned that there is no working group to address some of the challenges you described. Can you please elaborate on this and what it would look like? In Canada? Sure. Thank you. So right now, the conversation is basically being started by a small number of doctors across Canada who share similar concerns. Um, and then there are, of course, people who are very supportive of getting the word out, such as this uh, group um, and others. Um, but how I would envis this, ugh, <laughs> envision this working is we would need to meet nationally to have an evidence-based review of what is known. So, you know, instead of going and say, this is what I'm seeing, let's look at the evidence and let's look at the regional disparities, right? Because it's not always a one size fits all. Mm -hmm. And then I think we need to form regional uh, working groups based on some of the disparities that we see and make a list of priorities. For example, virtual care, right? Patient voice, uh, education. So I feel like there's many, there's many places that we could, take this, but I think it needs to start with a small working group of people who observe these conditions um, and then expand eventually to engage the communities once we uh, kind of have a game plan. Yeah. Thank you. It's, it's very interesting to me because I work for the health authority and we have a lot of different uh, lines into communities, different yes. um, kind of stovepipes, shall we say, in many areas. Yes. And I like the idea when you were talking about how this, uh, how the skin conditions are indicators of greater things. Yes. To me, to me, that things we that means that, as you said earlier, that we need to have a wide variety of stakeholders involved in these yes. uh, working groups. So Ab absolutely, thank you. And the other thing I want to mention is, although there's regional diversity, there are commonalities seen with rural and remote areas, right? Like it's like. You know, it's almost like pilot pro programs could be made. It's like, okay, well, let's let's do a pilot program in this area and run this virtual care model or this multidisciplinary module. Outcomes, make some outcomes, right? Like it's almost like you could structureize this better. But again, we always have to follow those OCAP principles if we're engaging communities. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And oh, just one more thing before I get to the next question. Um, we we do work with the health directors, non-insured, and and the, all those people that work with communities. So yes, I would like to connect with you later. Maybe we can uh, work on some connections. Yes, that sounds good. Yeah. Okay. And uh, one more question here uh, from Sylvia. A question for Rachel. Thank you for this insightful presentation. What are some roles that patient groups like CPN and CSPA can do can play to help us move towards some of the solutions you mentioned? Thank you. 
So as, you know, patient support groups, I think that these always should have the strongest voice because at the end of the day, everything we're talking about is impacting patients. Um, I think one thing other than what we've kind of chatted about, it would be helpful to have a focus group of the patients, you know, um, maybe like a pilot focus group of patients that might live in rural and remote community or maybe the healthcare practitioners too, or separate sessions where we come together and talk. Um, but I do, one thing I do want to mention is we're lacking preference and value studies of Indigenous peoples on conditions, com these common conditions, especially eczema. So we need to um, find out what, what the, these preferences and values of the patients are. What is their view? So I think that a, a working group for, for patients, a small pilot working group uh, would be wonderful. And I think we could focus maybe on ADs, skin infections, uh, caregivers, and patients with the condition. Um, as a researcher, I'm not as familiar how the legalities of putting all this stuff together with patient care from a, from this kind of standpoint, but uh, I would be happy to help design something, uh, given my time would allow that. And yeah, um, I mean, other things too. Um, I mean, I think you know, and I'm just kind of learning more about these patient groups, but helping to leverage some of this information to connect with people who might be able to help influence the formation of such groups or guidelines um, and helping to get the word out there. Uh, I think that's all important. Okay, thank you. There's also people who would like us to send you their information. Would that be okay? Yes. Yeah. If you could just collect them and put it in an email. Yes. And copy Ezra. Um, and if I was to say the one thing Paul, decision makers to take away is um, number one, uh, skin conditions are, are not just a skin problem. Uh, they can, especially when moderate to severe, they have a deep impact. We are lacking uh, initiatives in skin health on a holistic level, uh, given the complex internal external um, context that we're seeing. And number three, atopic dermatitis, eczema, bacterial skin infection, diabetic skin ulcers and wounds is where we need to start. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank we you. agree with that for sure. Yeah. Um, let me see. Uh, somebody made a suggestion, maybe start with Saskatchewan as a first region for this type of multi-sectoral work. It would be amazing if we could have any pilot area. Yeah, for here, we already have a wide base of patients. Um, but yeah, I feel like national or regional, um, either way would, would work well. Okay. And then um, one more question. What is the one main thing that you would like decision makers to take away or that we can take away for them? Eczema is a problem in young, in, in children and youth and Indigenous communities it's all over the literature, media and clinical experience. I would like to know why we don't have any focus or working groups in this condition when it's been identified as such a common problem mm -hmm. compared to other conditions like diabetes and so forth. I'd like to know why. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so are there any more questions? I would like to thank you all for having me and thank you for all the kind comments. Um, I'm a really busy gal these days <laughs> between work and my cat, but I always will uh, would be willing to um, move forward with such initiatives. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sinawasis. We, we really you. will take this further. Thank so, you so much. Yeah, yeah, I hope maybe I'll see you all again and enjoy the rest of your week. For sure. Thank you. And you too. Thank you. Yep. Massage your throat. Have some oh, tea. Yeah, no. <laughs> I know I'm going to cough it all up now. Okay, see ya. <laughs> all right. See ya. Thank you.